Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts, and I'm here to share a book haul with you from my most latest uh, visit to Europe and to the UK. Uh, I had two boxes that I shipped back. Ironically, usually this is a really good deal for me. Uh, this was not a good deal this time. Uh, I think the combination of a few different factors Number one, the dollar is really bad right now against the pound. So that made it very expensive already to ship back. The other challenge is that uh, with Brexit, the shipping costs are astronomical right now. So uh, I would advise not doing this. <laughs> if you're like, oh, Sarah does it all the time. Uh, Sarah won't, will be uh, really looking at the, the dollar the rates uh, moving forward. And I'm going to keep my packing slip uh, to, and then try to look at DHL, the DHL site to get a sense of what the cost would be so I can really think it through next time. Many of these books I could have bought through Blackwell's and gotten free shipping and not had to deal with the hassle. Uh, but there are some that are used books that I found on my, as I was walking around, that I really wanted to own. And so I think next time, if the rate is not good, I think what I'll do is just bring an extra duffel bag and, and only work within the limits of that and then make notes of the ones that I want to order from Blackwell's when I get home. That's what I'm going to do. So learn from my mistakes. <laughs> this book, ironically, is the second book. The first one is still en route. Um, so let me talk you through. This is, these are ones I bought in Oxford and London. So let me see, how do I want to do this? Let me start with the art books and nonfiction. Uh, the first one is this one. Gorgeous, gorgeous cover, right? This is Kiki Man Ray, Art, Love and Rivalry in 1920s Paris by Marc Broad. And let me make sure it's not translated. No, nope, not translated. And the back says, though many have never heard her name, Alice Prynne, Kiki de Montparnasse was the icon of 1920s Paris. She captivated as a groundbreaking performer, wrote a best-selling memoir, sold out exhibits of her paintings, and shared drinks with the likes of Pablo Picasso, Peggy Guggenheim, and Marcel Duchamp. She also shepherded along the career of a then-unknown American photographer, Man Ray. Of the two rising stars, it was Kiki who shone the brightest. So how did it happen that Man Ray went on to become one of the most famous photographers of the 20th century while her legacy was lost? Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> so looking forward to reading that. The other one, this just came out, uh, so I was really excited to get this in hardcover. This is Art Monsters, uh, Unruly Bodies in Feminist Art by Lauren Elkin. And the back of this says, for decades, feminist artists have confronted the problem of how to tell the truth about their experience as bodies. Queer bodies, sick bodies, racialized bodies, female bodies. What is their language and what are the materials we need to transcribe it? Exploring the ways in which these artists have taken up this challenge, Art Monsters is a landmark intervention in how we think about art in the body calling attention to a radical heritage of feminist work that not only reacts against patriarchy, but defines its own aesthetic aims. So this is getting a good buzz and I'm looking forward to reading this. This might be something that I hold for nonfiction November. Let me go to the literary fiction. Uh, I've seen, I think this was on the Costa Award list, uh, either short or long list. This is Lucy Caldwell's These Days, Two Sisters, Four Nights, One City. Really lovely cover. It says, uh, April 1941, Belfast has escaped the worst of the war so far. Following the lives of sisters Emma and Audrey, one engaged to be married, the other in a secret relationship with another woman, as they try to survive the horrors of the Belfast Blitz. These Days is an unforgettable novel about the lives lived under duress, about family, and about how we try to stay true to ourselves. Looking forward to reading that. 
then you'll see in the next book, I uh, the next box I talk about, this author uh, it appears over and over because the reissues from Daunt are so exquisite. This is Natalia Ginsberg. I just love these editions. This one is Family Lexicon with an introduction by Tim Parks. And this is translated by Jenny McPhee. So Daunt has just done a reissue of Natalia Ginsburg's works. I have a few of them already here and have, I think I've read one. So I'm looking forward to that. And guess what? It's Women in Translation Month in August. So I definitely will be reading at least one of my Natalia Ginsburg's that I have been collecting. This is Oh, to be a painter by Virginia Woolf. Uh, so this is the small little essay uh, that she that she did. Um, I think it's just a single essay. Yes, and it has this beautiful little image of her. Um, oh, it looks like it has a few different uh, forewords and some and some pieces of of writing that she's done on um, art, visual arts and painters and, and that all that stuff. So that will be exciting to read uh, in nonfiction November as well. Probably should have put it with the art stuff. Uh, I mentioned that this is the year of short stories for me where I'm really trying to explore short stories and test, put my toes in the water and really get a sense of it. This is an author I really have liked her sophistication, her layers, her richness of her writing. Uh, so we'll see how I get on with this. This is Selected Stories by Elizabeth Bowen. With uh, This was selected and introduced by Tessa Hadley. So really excited to, and trepidatious to try that one. Speaking of Bowen, this was one that I don't often see here in the United States. This is The Hotel by Elizabeth Bowen. And this says on the back, in the balmy days of 1920s, where could be more pleasant for a holiday than a hotel on the Italian Riviera, where indeed, filled with prosperous English visitors, the hotel offered a closed world of wealth and comfort. It also provides the stage for the display of social niceties, for passionate but unspoken love affairs, and for the comedy of the shared bathroom. With great wit and insight, Elizabeth Bowen's first novel lays bare the intricacies and eccentricities of polite society. So that sounds fantastic. And then the next book is by an author that I have not read, but I am excited to read uh, more of her fiction. This is her nonfiction. Uh, and this is kind of, as, as I travel, I also like to read about other women who are traveling. This is The Towers of Trebizond by Rose Macaulay put it up here, really lovely cover here. And on the back it says, as wise, civilized and wholly entertaining as it was when first published in 1956, the novel tells the beautifully absurd story of the imitable Aunt Dot, her niece Laurie and father Jauntry Pig, and of their expedition together to Turkey to explore the possibility of establishing a high Anglican mission there. Each member of the party has an additional extracurricular motivation for making the trip. Father Chantry Pig wishes to meet the fanatics in their residence at the top of Mount Ararat. Aunt Dot is set on the emancipation of Turkish women through wider use of the bathing hat. <laughs> Lori's object is pure pleasure. So that sounds like a fun novel. Keeping on the travel as a subject, this is uh, another author I've never read before, Barbara Toy. This is In Search of Sheba. Let me show you this cover, really bold cover here. And it says in here, in 1959, Barbara Toy, famous for her solo overland travels in North Africa and Arabia, set out in her trademark Land Rover to drive from Libya to Ethiopia. Alone, she crossed the Sahara Desert and the equatorial forests of the Congo before ascending into the highlands of Haile Selassie's empire. Her Ethiopian travels took her from modern Addis Ababa to the ruins of Aksum, through bandit-ridden countryside to the summit of Mount Wene, where male heirs to the emperor were traditionally imprisoned for life, on a quest to explore the legend of the Queen of Sheba. 
Full of good humor and grit, In Search of Sheba chronicles a remarkable feat of endurance and adventure by one of the 20th century's great travelers. So that sounds very fun. Also something for nonfiction November. Uh, then this I should have mentioned maybe more with some of the classics like the Bowen. Uh, this is one that I have not yet read, but I've seen the movie Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. Really sweet penguin cover here. Now, this is something that Leo of Leo's Little Book Life just read and said it was hysterically funny, uproariously funny. So uh, I, I realized like I haven't read it. I probably should own it and read it. Uh, the back of this says, when sensible, sophisticated Flora Post is orphaned at 19, she decides her only choice is to descend upon relatives in deepest Sussex. At the aptly named Cold Comfort Farm, she meets the doomed Stark Adders, cousins Judith, heaving with remorse for unspoken wickedness, Amos, preaching fire and damnation, their sons, lustful Seth and despairing Reuben, and crazed old aunt Ada Doom, who saw something nasty in the woodshed. But Flora loves nothing better than to organize other people and resolves to take each of them in hand, a hilarious parody of rural melodramas, Cold Comfort Farm is one of the best loved comic novels of all time. So that sounds fun. This is something that I'm always fascinated with Egypt as a setting. And so this is um, a mystery. I also love mysteries. This is Diary of a Country Prosecutor uh, by Tafik Al-Hakim. And it's translated by Abba Iban introduced by Richard Littler. So really great cover there. 1920s Cairo. I have a lot of 1920s uh, in here, huh? A young and ambitious prosecutor is dispatched from the bustling city to a provincial village to investigate a serious crime. Armed with his European education, the prosecutor is confident that he will dispense justice in this rural outpost. But as he becomes engrossed in village life, he finds himself increasingly befuddled by an alien legal system and the clueless bureaucrats who enforce it. As he teases out the facts of the case, one thing becomes clear, justice is never as simple as it seems. So that sounds really fun. Then I have a book that I was asking for on NetGalley, did not get a copy of, so decided I had to own it myself because I really, really liked um, the author's last work, Exciting Times. This is Nisha Dolan's The Happy Couple. I really like that cover. Um, and it fits so well with the cover of Exciting Times, which has like a very similar, simple, uh, modern kind of cover, colorful with two toothbrushes in a, in a glass. I think this is set at a wedding party and there's all these interpersonal dynamics at play that uh, are throwing the ceremony into um, some potential unrest. Uh, this one is signed by the author, so I'm excited by that, though I, I'm going to get I got to take this one, this one off. <laughs> Gross. I just need to get some of these off the covers. Okay. And then some used copies that I found at some thrift stores. Uh, this one, I have really loved this author, uh, Elizabeth Colgate. I read the shooting party and it was sublime. This is the summer of the Royal visit. Really good cover there. And this one says, toward the end of Queen Victoria's reign, tensions and excitement grow as a city prepares to welcome its monarch. But as the faint heat of summer intensifies, passions are ignited by an architectural competition to design a new hotel, and the harmonious facade of middle-class life suddenly begins to crumble, revealing dark and disturbing rivalries. A web of secret pathways where hidden desires, evil intentions, and moral chaos emerge. Uh, she was really good at providing a really thoughtful pace and plot for the shooting party. So I'm, I look forward to reading this. So the next one I found in a Oxfam, always a great place to find books, especially if you're in Oxford, because the you never know what you're going to find. And when I saw this author, I just smiled and and immediately grabbed it. Number one, it's a Virago. Number two, it's Olivia Manning. 
And Olivia Manning is someone that I absolutely adore. I read her books, uh, her two trilogies with a group of delightful people. So we read the Balkan trilogy and the Fortunes of War trilogy, and they were outstanding. This woman knows how to write character and place. And, uh, and I just, I loved those books and those experiences. So when I saw this, I had to jump at it. And it is practically pristine. This is The Wind Changes. Let me read the back. Dublin in 1921, a group of Catholics looked toward Riordan, their legendary leader for deliverance from the ignominious memory of the Easter Rising. At the end of the week, he will emerge from exile. The instigator of the plot is Sean, a young and intractable crusader who a vowel of self-sufficiency is undercut by his reliance upon the Englishman, Arian, ballast to Sean's colliding moods. Yet the real Arian is elusive and Sean's temper cannot reach him, nor can Elizabeth. Though she sometimes shares his bed, the hallmark of their liaison is indifference. As the week draws to a close, the links between them shift and strain, and for Sean and Elizabeth, its outcome can only signify betrayal. Blending the tensions of a political drama with an intricate portrait of three people and the loneliness with both separates and binds them, Olivia Manning has created a dexterous and haunting novel. So very excited to have another Olivia Manning ready to go. Okay, let's see. Um, now let's go to mysteries. So I always love to go to the UK because there's some mysteries that I just can't find here in the United States. This is the latest offering uh, by an author who I've really, really enjoyed uh, the last two books I've read by her. This is Laura Shepard Robinson and the Square of Sevens. I really liked this edition because it, look, it has the card suite right there. Uh, and I love the yellow. So this one says, uh, raised on the roads of Cornwall, a young girl known only as Red travels from village to village with her fortune-telling father, paying their way with an arcane method of cartomancy known as the Square of Sevens. When their luck sours, Red's father befriends a gentleman scholar, offering him an ancient document containing the secrets of the Square of Sevens in exchange for the scholar's promise to take Red into his care. Raised as a lady amidst the Georgian splendor of Bath, Red's fortune-telling skills are a delight in polite society, but she cannot ignore the questions that gnaw at her soul. Who was her mother? How did she die? Who are the enemies that her father always feared would find him? These mysteries take her from Bath to London, from the ribaldry of the Bartholomew Fair to the grand houses of two of the most powerful families in England. But others have embarked upon their investigations, determined to locate the stolen secret of the Square of Sevens, and Red's, Red's quest attracts their notice, bringing her greater danger, but also the possibility of great reward. So that sounds uh, like something to dive into. Next up is the second in a series that I have enjoyed uh, and actually thought about this as my husband and I were sitting on Brick Lane enjoying a vegetarian curry watching the world uh, kind of walk by. Seems like everyone in London was walking down that street that day. This is A.J. Chowdhury's The Cook. And this is the second in his series. And this says, uh, Camille Robin thought his crime-fighting days were behind him. But when a woman he knows is murdered and the police arrest the wrong person, he hangs up his apron and employs his detective skills once more to find the true killer. Meanwhile, the restaurant manager, Anjali, is volunteering with a homeless charity when she notices a sudden increase in deaths among people sleeping rough around Brick Lane. With the council uninterested, she starts an investigation of her own. Camille and Anjali's case seem unrelated, but as the duo dig deeper, they discover connections that stretch from London to Lahore. Together, they take on the indifference of authorities. If the Met won't find the murderers, then they will. Uh, I thought the first one was okay. I thought, you know, an, a nice setup. So this will be the one that it will sink or swim this series for me. Uh, I know there's another one that just came out. So yeah, we'll see what AJ Chowdhury has to, to offer this one. Uh, this is a series that my husband started reading. So I haven't yet got, gotten my hands on the, the first book. 
The first book was City of Vengeance by D.V. Bishop. Uh, this is the second. So I got this in preparation of whizzing through the first one and needing to get my grubby little hands on the second. Uh, and all you need to know, really, if you know me, is that this is set in Florence in 1537 game on, uh, and a gay character. So that, that sounds fantastic to me, but let me read the back of this. Florence, spring 1537. Cesare Aldo investigates a report of intruders at a convent in the Renaissance city. His case becomes far more complicated when a man's body is found deep inside the convent, stabbed more than two dozen times. Unthinkable as it seems, all the evidence suggests that one of the nuns must be the killer. Meanwhile, Constable Carlo Strocci finds human remains pulled from the Arno that belonged to an officer of the law missing since winter. The dead man had many enemies, but who would dare kill an officer of the city's most feared criminal court? As Aldo and Strocci close in on the truth, identifying the killers will prove more treacherous than either of them could ever have imagined. Sounds fantastic. Another, <laughs> this is a theme. I have another book written by this author that I have yet to get to, but got this one on, on faith. And this was also part of the buy one, get half one off price that I can never resist. It really pulls me in all the time. This is Lenora Natras. And uh, she ha she's, she's blurbed right here by S.G. McLean and Janice Hallett, both uh, writers that I like very much. Uh, and The Black Drop was her previous book. This is Blue Water. Uh, let me show you that cover. And it says New Year 1795 and Lawrence Jago is aboard the Tankerville mail ship sailing to Philadelphia. Lawrence is traveling undercover, supposedly as a journalist assistant, but his real mission is to protect a civil servant en route to Congress with a vital treaty that will stop the Americas from joining the French in their war against Britain. When the civil servant meets an unfortunate and apparently accidental end, the treaty disappears and Lawrence realizes only he can keep the Americas out of the war. Trapped on the ship with a strange assortment of travelers, including two penniless French aristocrats, an Irish actress and a dancing bear, Lawrence must hunt down both the lost treaty and the murderer before he has a tragic accident himself. Sounds fantastic. Uh, this was also part of that uh, buy one, get one half off price. This is The Three Dahlias by Katie Watson. Uh, this is lighter fare. Uh, it, it kind of, you know, like weekend uh, murder in the country kind of thing. Uh, three rival actresses team up to solve a murder at the stately home of Latisse Davenport, the author whose sleuthing creation of the 1930s, Dahlia Lively, had made each of them famous to a new generation. In attendance at Aldemir, the VIP fans staying at the house, the fan club president turned convention organizer, the team behind the newest movie adaptation of Davenport's books, the Davenport family themselves, and three actresses famous for portraying Dahlia Lively through the decades. Each actress has her own interpretation of the character and her own secrets to hide. But this English summer weekend, they will have to put aside their differences as the crimes at Aldermir turn anything but cozy. So light palate cleansing reads. Then I could not resist this new series that Penguin has come up with, with this go these gorgeous, really vivid green uh, spines. And these are little almost, uh, almost novella size, shorty September. Uh, I'm, I probably will read one or two of these then. So let me kind of show you these. This is Edogawa Rampo's Beast in the Shadows. Really kind of spooky cover here. And this back says, a mystery writer turns detective to protect the woman he loves, but is he hunter or hunted? The chance meeting between a crime novelist and a married woman blossoms into friendship. When she confides to him that she has been receiving threatening and sadistic letters from an ex-lover, who says he's watching her in the shadows, he knows he must help her. But the trail unexpectedly leads to another writer, Oi Shende, the mysterious and secretive author of the works of grotesque violence. 
suddenly nothing is as it seems and nobody is safe. I was like, it might be a little too gruesome. I don't know. We'll see. At least it's short. Uh, but I am not afraid to uh, DNF a book, even if I bought it and paid ridiculous amounts to ship it back. Okay, this one is Magre and the Headless Corpse by George Simenon. And this is translated by uh, Howard Curtis. Oh, and let me say who translated this one. Wish they'd put it on the cover. This is translated by Ian Hughes from the Japanese. The back says, a dismembered body in a canal, a baffling case, a mysterious inheritance. It starts when a man's arm is fished out of Paris's Canal Saint-Martin. The rest of the body is retrieved apart from the head. Inspector Magre is determined to unearth the truth behind this disturbing murder. When he meets the strangely taciturn owner of a shabby local bistro, Madame Cala, who says her husband is away, the pieces start to fall into place. But as the dogged, laconic detectives discovers, nothing in this tangle case is as it seems. Right up my alley. You had me at Paris. And then this one. This is a Jean Le Carré call uh, for the dead. Call for the dead. An apparent suicide, a deepening mystery, a letter from a dead man. Secret agent George Smiley is in trouble. A foreign office civil servant, Samuel Fennon, has killed himself, and Smiley realizes that intelligence head Mastin is going to set him up to take the blame. Beginning his own investigation, Smiley is shocked to receive an urgent letter from the dead man and slowly uncovers a network of deceit and betrayal. Le Carre's debut novel is also the first of many books to feature the tenacious, unassuming, and singular George Smiley. So I'm excited to, to read his first book. So there we go. That is box number one. I will share with you box number two when it comes. And that box will have some purchases from Copenhagen, from Brussels, as well as London. That's it for me for now. I would love to know, have you read any of these? Uh, what did you think? Uh, do you have any like these that you think I should be on my radar? And that's it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.